So, good morning, everyone. So, it's my great pleasure to talk about you know, lipid membranes or cell surfaces and membrane mimics at this interesting Swedenness course. And before I start talking about science, I would like to briefly introduce you myself because I'm not a Swedish professor. Yeah. So, as Tommy mentioned, I was born and grown up in Kyoto and got my PhD in Kyoto University. But during my PhD, I spent some time in Helsinki and also in Copenhagen, precisely speaking in Lundby, yeah, in DTU. After my PhD, I moved to Germany 23 years ago and kept my career here mainly. So I started as a postdoc in the physics department in Munich under the guidance of Erich Sackmann. He was one of the pioneers of membrane physics in Germany and Europe. And then later on, I got an independent grant to run my team myself for five years in Munich. Then made my habilitation degrees in physics at Munich. Right afterwards, I got promoted as a full professor of chemistry and later on physics at Heidelberg. Yeah, then since 2013, I revived my activities after 15 years of absence in Kyoto, leading a team there. So the reason why I'm here is because of your academic coordinator, yeah, Tommy. So he mentioned already that we met for the first time, I think 15, 16 years ago. And afterwards, I don't know how many different places and occasions we met and had beer, yeah, and talking about science in different cities and countries. So here are Tommy and me, yeah, yeah. One was you know, the summer school held in the island Uto ten years ago, and the second one I showed you is you know, the conference that I organized in Kyoto, where also Pago is. In the middle. So in my team, I have three scientific pillars. The, I'm soft matter physicist by training. So you know, the main pillar is dealing with physics or biological soft interfaces, where I shed light on structure, mechanics, and dynamics using both real space techniques as well as reciprocal space technique, like scattering. This stems out into two direction. The light left one is you know, suited for Heidelberg, which is strongly in biomedicine, where I study the non equilibrium physics of life, especially focusing on the physics of diseases and development. Another direction that I'm working still on is to create biosemiconductor hybrid materials, such as depositing you know, membrane mimics on the surface of gallium nitride quantum dots or two-dimensional electron gases and quantum wires to detect the smart biofunctions as an electro optoelectric system. So of course today I would like to focus sharply on my main field, physics of biological interfaces. So that's the reason why I chose this, or I like this topic to talk. So to start from, you know, let me start from a historical question about molecules at interface. In 1774, Benjamin Franklin made a very short report at the Royal Society meeting. He reported that when a tin spoonful of olive oil was spread on the pond, it steals away. But most importantly, the effect reached up to one quarter acre, but not more. So that's a very short message. And you, know, you may ask yourself what one can learn out of it. And of course, this is not an experiment recommended nowadays for the sake of environment. When you pour oil on the, pond, you know, on the water surface of a pond, I think some people will call the police. The answer is given by Lord Rayleigh, another famous guy 
about 100 years later. What he did was he just divide volume by area and gain the thickness of the film of olive oil being one nanometer. Now we know that this is a very simple calculation, but giving us a right guess about the size or thickness of monolayer of fatty acids. This is so simple, but no, we tend to forget that the interface is not just a boundary that separates two bulk phases, but they have structures as well as the functions. This is manifested in biological systems. So we can learn why does interface matter by visiting nature again. So I took a very famous cartoon from Strayer's textbook. You know? It's showing that in biological cells, many key reactions are confined near the interface, which is nothing but the cell membrane separating interior and exterior worlds. So one can think of the importance of membrane from the economical viewpoint. So we can start from a classical, classical, most costly equation of diffusion and calculate the diffusion time required for a particle collide with another one located at the distance B. And we do it in 2D and 3D spaces. This was firstly shown by Stefan Hart in Weizmann in the late 70s. And the solution shows that you know, the dependence of tau on 2 and 3D is quite different. So the tau, at least the diffusion time, in 2D scales with natural log of r, while the one in 3D scale with 1 over r. Clearly indicating that the dependence of diffusion time on R is minor in 2D. And this explains indeed the confinement of reaction in or near 2D cell membrane is very much an economically clever solution to run the reaction involving biomacromolecules such as proteins and enzymatic complexes. As you learn already from Ilpo's lecture this morning, membranes are not just boundary or wall, but membranes you know, actively control the biological function, such as protein recognition, receptor activation, and so on and so forth. So here I show you one of one picture I presented in one of the most recent review together with my teacher, Eric Sackman where we showed the proteins involved in cell migration, which are shown in this cartoon. You know, if you zoom into the you know, region near the spreading front of a migrating cell, you find many protein machineries involved. But all these proteins are initially swimming in cytosolic space and they are not active unless they are recruited to the membrane surface. And the binding you know, of the PI3 kinase is indeed the master switch producing a lot of PIP3 lipids, so phosphoinositol 3-phosphate lipids that connects proteins to the membrane. Also, if you see from the mechanical viewpoint, cell membranes possess very unique mechanical properties which are playing instrumental roles in sustaining our life. As I show here with the scheme, you know, membrane cons uh, consisting of amphiphilic lipid molecules. And lipid itself has a polar head and hydrophobic tails, sharing common features with symmetric liquid crystals. So symmetric liquid crystal phase is the leftmost phase on the right panel. 
Actually, in the 70s, many physicists working on liquid crystals become aware of unique mechanics of liquid membranes, and they actually build up the fundament of membrane biophysics. So in this slide, I show you three principal mechanical parameters describing the mechanical properties of lipid membranes. So the first mode is an isotropic extension and contraction. And the middle one is a shearing deformation, which is a deformation which is not accompanied by the change of the area. And the third one is the bending deformation which comes from the asymmetric you know, tension balance between interior inside and outside of the film. So everything can be represented by the Hookian energy representation I show in the lower part, which is given by one half times the modulus times the strain to the power of two. So this is exactly what you learned in high school about the Hookian spring. So as one of the prominent examples of biological membranes mechanics, I selected one very well known example, human red blood cells. Here I show you some statistics. So, so about 10 to the power of 13 cells are running inside our body. And actually, when I was a student, I was astonished to see the production rate. rate. One million cells per second are produced in our bone marrow. And they are traveling over 400 kilometer distance in 12 days, keeping finite volume and area in order to avoid the clotting. So, so they are traveling long distance, passing through many narrow capillaries. So what I show here is a movie taken by my student showing unhealthy red blood cells passing through a constriction which has the cross section of three by four micrometers mimicking the capillaries. What is intuitive is you know, the healthy guys are, a are able to go through these narrow channels and you know, easily recover their original shapes. But you know, the disease cells, as well as aged cells, you know, cause are stiffer than the healthy one, and they are often rupture you know, when they are encountering to this kind of constriction. In fact, the membrane has extremely low bending modulus, 10 to about minus 20 joule, and low shear modulus, 10 to the power minus six Newton per meter, which are like thousand to hundred thousand times softer compared to polyethylene films, which has a similar thickness. So compared to plastic foils, they are thousand to hundred thousand times softer. And this is a secret why they are able to keep their structure integrity against the strong shear stresses. So now we look into the multicellular systems. And the first question that I can ask myself is how are these cell cell and cell tissue contacts are precisely controlled? And when we look into the you know, biological system, we find that many cell cell or cell tissue contacts keep a very finite and well controlled spacing to avoid non specific contact. No? with an aid of many biopolymers. What I show here on the left is taken from Albert, showing two plant cells, two neighboring plant cells, whose contact is mediated by a 200 nanometer thick cellulose layer. So if I draw a cartoon showing this, you know, the scheme looks like on the right. Yeah. In fact, you no know, many cell cell contacts are mediated by biopolymers containing sugars, and they are controlling the generic and specific interaction balances in order to 
finally adjust the sensing contact. Actually, from the viewpoint of physics, you know, cell cell contact can be treated as a subtle problem of wetting physics. There are two important points for us to keep in our mind. The first point is the stratified layers, namely layer by layer structure, like you saw in the previous slide. You know? So, cytosolic polymer and membrane, extracellular polymer, membrane, and cytosols. They are stable only if the complete wetting conditions are fulfilled at the interface. Namely, the presence of an additional layer. For instance, in this cartoon, the additional layer means lipid membrane. This must result in the gain of the surface free energy, which is characterized by the spreading coefficient as being positive, which was described by the John and Francois Brochard you know, quite some time ago. Second, when you look at the vertical force interactions, you know, to keep a finite intercellular distance of typically tens to hundreds of nanometers, the interaction potential at the interface should be kept weakly repulsive. So if you think about the interfacial forces contributing to these biological interfaces, you can name some, like electrostatic interactions, van der Waals, hydration repulsion, and entropic forces generated by conformational fluctuation of polymers, as well as thermal fluctuation of membrane. But if you think about cell-cell contacts, it's very difficult or almost impossible to dissect each force contributor. Therefore, we can grab the say, net force acting per unit area, which is nothing but the disjoining pressure. This is a concept written by Deryagin you know, from Russia for quite some time ago. And from the thermodynamic viewpoint, the disjoining pressure is nothing but the first derivative of the work you have to invest to change the distance between two membranes with respect to the distance. As you can imagine, the minimum can be found. So corresponding to the equilibrium corresponds to the zoning pressure equals zero can be found only if the second derivative goes to positive. On the other hand, if you have negative disjoining pressure, this causes a continuous thinning of the interlayer, which eventually results in the dissipation or rupture. And this is nothing but a scenario of wetting duetting transitions. So therefore, in order to understand the physics behind the design of defined cell membrane models with less complexity would be helpful to reveal how biopolymers modulate interfacial interactions. So now we come to yeah, see the very important model of cell surfaces called supported membranes. There was a very historically important, I think, review published by Eric Sackman 25 years ago in Science entitled Supported Membranes. You know, this is now cited over 2000 times and now it's really widely spread all over the world. So the first report came from Adrian Bryan and Harden McConnell from Stanford 36 years ago. The system looks like that. You have a planar lipid bilayer deposited on planar substrate. And the membrane is separated from the substrate with a very thin water reservoir, which has a thickness of five to 10 angstroms. Compared to the other membrane models, like the you know, black lipid membrane, liposomes, 
you know, the advantages of the supported membrane is first, they can stably coat macroscopically large surfaces, which can go even, you know, easily beyond tens of square centimeters. And also you can study the structure and function using various surface sensitive techniques, such as AFM, you know, because of the planar geometry of the sample. Actually, in the review written in 1996, Eric already mentioned that this model of biomembrane that allowed the application of a manifold of surface sensitive techniques. And they form versatile models of low dimensionality complex fluids, which can be used to study interfacial forces and wetting phenomena and adhesion. And even he started talking about practical applications for towards the design of biosensors on electro-optical devices. So about 30 years ago, related to neutron science, there are two important, two important papers published by Swedish, British, and German physicists. You know? The first paper I picked was published by Adrian Rennie, you know, who was at that time ILL, and Robert uh, Bob Thomas in Oxford, and Eric Sackman from Munich. They did the specular neutral reflectivity of lipid bilayer deposited on quartz substrate using ILL D17, which is still one of the say, top runners in the field of neutron reflectometer. The second paper I picked was also published by these people. Well, they were very active in this year, obviously, where they performed the new specular neutron reflectivity of lipid monolayer at the auto interface. There they used crisp beam line at ISIS, the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. So these systems have been used like a gold standard and still we are using this lipid monolayer and supported membranes as a cell surface mimics. But you now when you want to go towards more biological questions, there is a fundamental problem, so especially for supported lipid membranes, which is a direct protein substrate contact. The drawback of the supported membrane is when you incorporate transmembrane proteins, you know, they are sticking out of the membrane typically by 10 nanometers. You know? So when you deposit them on solid substrate, they always in encounter the risk of protein denaturations and also ill-defined density and orientation of membrane proteins. On the right, I show one of the data presented in my old, old paper, you know, where we stained platelet integrin alpha 2b beta 3 and incorporate them into supported membranes and deposited on quartz substrates. As you can see, the picture looks very ugly, you know, where the protein say, distribution is very inhomogeneous. And when we perform the fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching experiments, we found that almost all proteins are completely pink. So to overcome this problem, we developed new models of cell membrane called polymer supported membranes. Now, in this field, I published a review in Nature 15, 16 years ago, together with Eric, which was a time when I graduated from his school and moved to Heidelberg. And this morning I checked, you know, then found that this paper was now cited more than a thousand times. In this review, we focused on the influence of soft interlayers on wetting interactions, as well as in the technological applications. So what is important is this polymer supported membrane 
can be considered as a half model of cell-cell contact. So again, I show this cartoon of cell-cell contact mediated by polymers. And if you cut in the middle plane and deposit it on solid support, you find polymer supported membranes. You can consider this solid substrate as another cell membrane, or you can consider that this is a half model. In 2007, I published um, quite a heavy paper in Physical Review Letters, short, you know, where we control the density and the thickness of the polymer layer, layers and measured the diffusion of the integrin protein, which I showed in the previous slides. Now you see the proteins are completely uniformly distributed, unlike the one I showed here. No? So they are the same proteins, but now they are deposited on 10 nanometer thick cellulose film. So starting from the classical Einstein's equation modified by introducing the two-dimensional viscosity as well as a dimensionless particle radius, epsilon, one can actually precisely calculate the frictional coefficient you know, exerted on proteins as well as the interlayer viscosity, which is regulated by the density and the thickness of the polymer interlayers. In the following accounts, we demonstrated that actually about tens of nanometers thick ultra thin polymer interlayers enables the maintenance of lateral diffusivity as well as the receptor functions for various transmembrane proteins. So now we come to examine the structure aspects of these polymer supported membranes. And here we use, of course, neutron reflectivity. So what I show here in panel A and B are taken from our previous paper, showing the reflectivity of SOPC, so steroid oleophosphatidylcholine membrane deposited on thin and thick cellulose film. So the advantage of our cellulose is we deposit them layer by layer and each layer has a thickness of five angstroms in dry state. So we know exactly the, or we can control the thickness by the layer numbers. As you can see with lines presented in the, each panel, you know, the data are well fitted with the slab models. You know, and the neutral reflectivity of membrane exhibited very clear fringes in Fresnel plot, where we plotted the reflectivity multiplied by Q to the power of four, indicating the formation of a layer structures with clear SLD contrast, scattering length density contrast, contrast. This is a very good sign of the formation of high quality membrane because we do the ex we did the experiments in D2O. And since the lipid hydrophobic interior of lipid membrane you know, hates water, so this gives us a clear SLD contrast. Also what we found was a Gaussian roughness of membrane is much higher compared to that on sub solid supports indicating the fluctuation of membrane under shallower confinement, which means indeed the theoretical prediction made by Reinhard Piposki and Leibler in the 80s. So to see, confirm that the answers or specific results we got are unique and solid, you know, we performed also specular X-ray reflectivity. So here, you know, you note that the specular X reflectivity of systems underwater is in principle not possible because unless you use a high energy X ray. So, in these experiments, we use the high energy X ray at ESRF, you know, using the beam 
with an energy of 22 kilo electron volt, which is far beyond of the elastic absorption peak or absorption band you know, of water existing at around eight kilo electron volt. So the use of high energy X-ray guarantees the high enough transmittance of beam through bulk water. The advantage we're using, say, or the difference from the neutron defectivity is that for X-ray, the contrast of the scattering length density is much poorer between the elements existing in biological systems. <coughs> but the resolution is much higher. So if you compare the Q range you know, presented in this and the previous slides, you see that in the previous slides, you know, with neutron, you can go at most up to 0.3 reciprocal angstroms typically, but you know, with X-ray, you can go up to 0.5 with no problems of the counting statistics. So despite of the fact that they give different resolution and the contrast, the best fit results converged each other, confirming that the, you know, our solution was unique. So this brought us to the point to nail down the physical roles of biopolymers in fine adjustment of interfacial interactions. Again, you know, the See, dissolving pressure equals zero is found at the equilibrium cell substrate distance. Since SOPC, so phosphatidylcholine is beta ionic and cellulose is neutrally charged, so we ignore the electrostatic interactions and focus on three major force contributors van der Waals, hydration repulsion, and the Helfrich repulsion, which was originating from, which is originating from the thermally activated membrane fluctuations. So the important thing is all these three major forces can be quantitatively calculated. I show you two examples because van der Waals is far much complicated. So I show you the case of Helfrich and hydration repulsion. So Helfrich repulsion was described by Wolfgang Helfrich, you know, the German theorist in 1978, you know, you know, which indicates the scaling of the repulsive pressure, you know, which is proportional to one over D to the power of three. So what you can plug, what you should plug in is only the kappa. This is a bending rigidity which I mentioned, you know. And this is measurable and also you can get easily from the literature in the range of you know, 20, 30 KT. The hydration repulsion you know, is a bit more tricky because you need to get two numbers, the offset pressure as well as the decay length. The scaling is very simple. It's an exponential decay function. These two values required to quantify the hydration repulsion can be calculated from the measurement of the film thickness as a function of osmotic pressure. This can be done by lipsometer or you know, X-ray neutron defectometer coupled to a humidity chamber. So what we performed or what we did here is to compare the theoretical prediction versus the experimental data. What I show here on the left and right are the results, computed results on thick, a thin and thick cellulose. On thin cellulose, when we added up the van der Waals, black, Helfrich, green, and hydration repulsion, blue, we get the net force shown in red. You see a clear crossing of the force zero. So corresponding to the equilibrium distance, which is you know, 
about 140 angstroms. And if we compare this, this value to the values we obtain from experiments, they are in pretty much good agreement. In contrast, you know, when you look at the data on six cellulose, first you note that the position of zero force is much less prominent. For instance, when you, you know, look at the y-axis scaling of left and right, it's different by a factor of 30, okay? So although it looks similar, it's 30 times shallower than it appears when you plot it here. So this means that on six cellulose, hydration repulsion is more dominant so that the point of zero force is very vaguely confined compared to the thin one. So as a result, we demonstrated that the counterplay of attractive van der Waals interaction shown in this massive black curve and the hydration repulsion, which is an exponential repulsive force, confines indeed the membrane position. But in this case, the role of you know, thermal undulation of membrane is less prominent. So along this line, we also made a small breakthrough where we succeeded in controlling the density and orientation of protein by spreading of native cell membranes directly onto runner support. What we did first was the use of human red blood cells. So we took the blood of Stefan Kaufmann in my lab and also my blood in you know, 20 years ago, it was allowed and now, nowadays it's no longer allowed. But you know, in that time, we just took out that and prepared the ghost cells simply by removing the cytosols from the cell. We just throw them onto planar substrate with and without polymer and see the orientation of cells by putting antibodies, recognizing inside or outside of the cell. What we first observed was on quartz and glass substrates, we saw nothing, no adhesion, no rupture, which is a kind of understandable because the surface of adult animal cells are covered with negatively charged sugars called sialic acid. But when we did the same procedure on 10 nanometer thick cellulose, and apply the you know, antibody recognizing the cytoplasmic domains of band three proteins, we obtain such a picture. Yeah, it's a very frequently asked question. So I want to tell you that it's not the paint. No, it's not the paint in a Photoshop, but it's an immunofluorescence picture of my blood cells stained from inside. You see uniform and continuous coverage. On the other hand, when you apply the antibody going to the outside site exocellular domains of glycophorin, for instance, we saw nothing. So this means that now we have the scenario of complete wetting of cell membranes simply by having 10 nanometer thick polymers. The cell first adheres on the surface, pulled by tension and rupture expose their inside and fuse with each other to form a continuous film, which is exactly as I mentioned at the introductory part about the scenario of complete wetting. This was indeed the first example of two-dimensional cell membranes where the 3D cells were transformed into quasi two-dimensional films with a perfectly defined membrane orientation. Also, we scratch the membrane from the surface and run them into, throw them into SDS page and found that the protein compositions were also kept very well. This enabled us actually to go to X-ray neutron 
because we now can cover macroscopically large substrates with native cell membranes spread in 2D. You can imagine that's a very nice tool to look into the structure of real cell membranes. Here I show you on the left, the high energy X-ray reflectivity data for healthy human red blood cell membranes, and on the right, the neutron reflectivity data. So the right was shown in Fresnel plot just to show you a bit better features. We actually demonstrated that the same principle works for other native membranes, such as microsome, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and plasma membrane extracts. So now we are going to a very realistic biological same surface mimic. And this is very intuitive that you know, the wetting concept or wetting physics concept is very important. You know? Like the bare glass, no adhesion, no wetting. On soft polymer or on cellulose films, you no know, complete wetting. So this kind of wetting contrast between solid substrate and polymer supports brought me to another step to utilize wetting contrast to make micro patterns of cell membranes. So now I have been talking about the macroscopically large substrate. For neutron defectivity, we cover the substrate with the size of five by eight centimeters, 40 square centimeters substrate. Now I want to make them like a micro patterns. To do so, we micro pattern cellulose support either by UV lithography or by microcontact print, the BSA, so bovine serum albumin, which is avoid, uh, which avoids the adhesion and spreading of cell membranes. Both worked out beautifully. So the top one is the see, immunofluorescence picture of human red blood cell membrane grid, see, printed onto the substrate. So only these grid parts are showing immunofluorescence positive signal, and these are all backgrounds. The bottom picture shows the sarcoplasmic reticulum extracted from rabid muscles, and the green is showing the BSA, you know, stained with FITC, and the right shows the grid of sarcoplasmic reticular membrane, which was stained by the antibodies to calcium ATPase. So as you saw, these papers have been published already quite some time ago. And actually afterwards, quite some followers came up, but up to my knowledge, maybe I'm wrong, but you know, we are the first one and the only one team that can fabricate both macroscopically large as well as micro patterns to dimensional cell membranes. So now I come to the last part you know, of my lecture where I want to show you how one can model the interactions between neighboring cell membranes mediated via membrane bound carbohydrates, which is nothing but glycocalyx. You know? So as a model system, we designed the stacks of synthetic and natural glycolipids, which are shown on the left with structures. And when we deposited thousands of these membranes, you know, membrane stocks on solid supports, I call them as multiple supported membranes or polymer supported membranes. So as I show, you know, indicate with red characters or the red text, you know, I was very lucky to get an outstanding synthetic chemist as well as microbiologist who can offer me very unique and well-defined sugar lipids, you know, either mimicking the lipids in animal and plant systems or in bacterial systems. As an experimental technique, we utilize off-specular neutron scattering, you know, where we detect the scattered beam you know, impinging to the planar stacks of membrane you know, using 2D detectors. You know. And what I show on the right here is the say, raw detector readout 
flow presented in the angular coordinates, gamma and omega. This experiment can be done in ILL D16 beam line, you know, and this was strongly supported by the local scientist Bruno de Lille. So the advantage of this system is that owing to the planar geometry of the sample, one can discriminate the momentum transfer perpendicular and parallel to the membrane plane, simply from the geometric consideration. So you see only gamma and omega are in these equations. So this means that the specular signals reflects the vertical structure information and intermembrane potential, while the off specular intensity reflects the lateral structure ordering and membrane mechanics. So after you measure the signals using nice 2D detector, you have to work a little bit. So here we have to compute the scattering signals. To do so, we have to revisit, we had to revisit the basic framework of discrete symmetric Hamiltonian, which was theoretically written by Leibner and Diposky in the 80s. Here, the Hamiltonian contains two key parameters. First is the compression modulus B. So that's a vertical compression modulus B and the bending rigidity kappa. On the other hand, when you see the data from the analytic viewpoint, the scattering function from stratified rough interfaces within the first bond approximation is written in that form. Now, this was written by Sina in mid 90s. And although this looks very complicated, most important bits here is this G as a function of R called displacement correlation function. And this displacement correlation function is determined by two key mechanical parameters, lambda and eta. Lambda is named the jump parameter and no eta Cayet parameter. And what's notable is both lambda and eta are the products of kappa and B. So this means from the analysis, if you can find the best combination of lambda and eta, you can calculate the kappa and B, which are corresponding one by one. What I want to emphasize here is there is an important see, number we need to introduce called R, that's a cutoff radius, which represents the finite size effect. If you do not limit this lower limit, the displacement correlation function becomes you know, dispersive, so you know the roughness becomes infinitely large when you make the separation between two points larger and larger. This size can be determined by the size of the membrane patches, which we can determine by optical microscopy or atomic force microscopy. So plugging these numbers, you know, we actually computed the scattering signals. You know, what I show this in this slide is the direct comparison of the second black sheet for, from experiments and simulations. As you can agree, probably, yeah, this is a very nice agreement. And what I want to emphasize here is the introduction of the cutoff radius indeed allows a full calculation of scattering functions with no floating parameters. So this means if you plug in instrument resolution function and also the cutoff radius, you can be fully quantitative. This is an advantage compared to the previous approach where you have to approximate something to fit the signal. So this technique was applied to shed light on the influence 
of the carbohydrate conformation on the mechanical properties. We started from a simple glycolipids, so possessing glucose and galactose unit on the head. One is the enteobios, which is mimicking the lipoteic acid in gram-positive bacteria, and the other one is a lactose lipid. And the difference, only difference between two lipids are the glycosidic junction, either 1,6 or 1,4. By comparing two modeling, you find that simply by bending the cylindrical lipid you know, head groups to the bent one, the bending rigidity decreases by a factor of four. On the other hand, when we look at, you know, extend this idea to a bit more complex lipids, you know, we performed experiments with Daniel Wertz. He's an organic chemist in Göttingen and now in Braunschweig. You know, he designed the GB3 lipids, which are known to be the glycolipids or gangliosides accumulating in the eyes of patients suffering from Fabry disease. So here you have the lactose unit plus one more branch here. So by adding just one branch, you, know, you see that the bending rigidity decreased by factor of two and the uh, bending rigidity decreased by factor of two and compression modulus as well. This was extended to more complex glycolipids you know, by taking the bacterial lipopolysaccharides. That's what I collaborated with Klaus Brandenburg from Research Center Boston, that's the northern part of northern edge of Germany, where he could actually extract the high purity lipopolysaccharides from various bacterial glutens by chopping the sugar chains at the position of interest, like I indicated with black lines. One can test a very short one called lipid A up to the rough mutants you know, with the outer inner and outer membrane cores, as well as a wild type lipopolysaccharides, including you know, polysaccharides chains. So what we found, so Rafael, my former postdoc found was the bending rigidity and compression modulus is modulated by the genetic mutation of sugar chains. For example, if you compare the shortest lipid A and the longest you know, mutant APSRA, which has, I think eight or 10 additional sugars, we see that the compression modulus decreased by a factor of four because these sugars are softer so that they are, say, you know, the compression modulus gets smaller. So we showed that the off specular neutron scattering is a good tool, a powerful tool to, that enables the influence of chemical, genetic, and epigenetic modification on membrane mechanics. To conclude, uh, to conclude, now, I hope that I could give you a flavor that cell membranes are just not a boundary, but doing more. You know? So they act as biological reaction hubs regulating many critical functions. And the unique mechanical properties of cell membrane shown by red blood cells are tightly coupled to biological functions, you know, which can be described within the framework of synecdic liquid crystals. The recent development, as I showed in the last part, of both biochemical and instruments enables to design more precise biological relevant models of cell membranes. I started from very simple supported membrane developed 35 years ago. And now we are dealing with much more realistic and complex mimics of cell surfaces. The combination of neutron and X-ray effectivity is also a very good tool to probe the detailed structure of complex and varied interfaces underwater. 
unleavening the interplay of interfacial forces regulating the Western complex. And finally, the off specular scattering so, is a good tool that you know, quantitatively unravels the how chemical, genetic, and epigenetic changes in membrane bound carbohydrates would affect the mechanics of membranes. So since this is a lecture, so I do not want to give acknowledgement to the funding sources, but you know, I want to convince you that the near future development of instruments will enable us to tackle more challenging problems using neutron. So instead of thanking to the money, I want to thank my students, postdocs, and colleagues. Now, many of them got the permanent faculty positions outside Germany or inside Germany as well. And you know the supports by the large facility like ILL and ESF were instrumental. And as you see, the interdisciplinary collaboration with chemists, medical scientists, as well as microbiologists made us very unique and strong. And I thank for your attention. Tommy, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I think there is time for uh, a lot of questions. I hope there are some. Yeah, you have some questions here. Oh, uh, we waiting, waiting, waiting. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I think it's 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 very interesting that you actually can look at at real uh, real cell membrane. I think we always are struggling. We always are doing the UPC with uh, five percent uh, the UPS or whatever. So I think it's um, it's it's very useful to be able to look at the real yeah. uh, real membrane and and, uh, and so on and uh, sometimes one can argue it's complex but complexity is sometimes necessary mm -hmm. i think yeah Go for because the they have and, uh, quite a sense yeah, yeah in biology yeah yeah so how much uh, but oh, can I you ask, ask the question who is the I question can... Yes, uh, thank you very much for a great presentation. And I just have a general question, mm -hmm. maybe to hear your point of view. Like, what do you think are the main challenges right now uh, where the research is going in the, this like interface lipid kind of systems? Because it feels like you are also a pioneer in this, in this field right now. So, mm -hmm. so maybe some comments. Yes. So one direction that I think is interesting is to go into the influence of disease and aging on the membrane. You know, because you know, you know, many biochemical studies suggested that you know, the structure as well as the composition of lipid membranes are modulated by aging and diseases. And indeed, you know, what I plan together with Tommy this fall is to spread the red blood cells infected by malaria parasite on polymer support and look at how the malaria parasites modulate the site skeletons as well as membrane proteins. And for the mechanics using microfluidics and other methods, I really demonstrated that the you know, disease actually modulated the mechanics of the membranes a lot. So now I want to shed light on the structure. And another direction that I would be very keen on testing or going myself you know, until the end of my career, so I'm not too old, yeah? So is you know, to go into the dynamics. So now I'm looking more or less you know, on the equilibrium systems you know, because of the time window that we can assess. But maybe you heard that lecture of Vicky, yeah? About the inelastic neutron scattering yeah, in spin echo. 
So back in the days, you know, using ILL, I mean, if we want to look at the mechanical properties of cell membranes, you know, using spin echo, I mean, I needed two weeks or one month, not in the reality. And we need to have tons of samples. But you no, know, if we imagine the situation of using the spallation source, I think that's something that I'm definitely interested in doing myself, yeah, as soon as the instrument is ready. And that's actually the, one of the reasons why you know, I and Tommy are in close contact. You know? So I bring some strange systems with a bit of idea of physics. And you know, the experts like Tommy and you know, Vicky and you know, these people can support us to realize this idea. Yeah? And in synchrotron, it's also interesting to look at the dynamics using X-ray photocorrelation spectroscopy and other methods. And, this was also very much limited in the past because of the coherency of the X-ray as well as the intensity. And I was luckily involved in the upgrade committee of ESRF and we use as influence the panel to strengthen the coherence. So in two years now or five years now, I think they should have 30 times higher coherence, which enables us to really do XPCS for also biological membrane. So you know, to conclude, you know, my interest goes to aging diseases, you know, as well as to dynamics. I think these two are what I think to be an exciting field in the future. Thank you very much. And I'm also yeah. thinking that this new like methods with uh, time, time resolved experiments and free electron lasers are mm -hmm. also like enabling like another level of this dynamic and structural motion analysis. Yes. yes. Yeah. So X, you know, XFEL is a nasty method, you know, because you just burn the stuff with an intensive pulse and observing the shot. Yeah. But on the other hand, I mean, this is a very you know cute method which I didn't try myself yet, but I think this opens up also the future. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And any more comments? Oh, there is a hand. Ying. Um, I have a basic question about uh, uh, the interplay of interfacial forces regulating the wetting contact. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember you mentioned many forces, including the um, <laughs> hydration force. And can you give a comment on what is hydration force? Is it only and persist between the bilayer membranes and what is it originated from? Yeah, so hydration repulsion is a generic force. You now, and I think in Lund, you know, Hokan Venastro yeah. is one of the pioneers and another one in the US is you know, Adrian Passagian. And I, I think I just mentioned about Adrian, which I felt a bit dangerous here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, this is how the, uh, no, the hydration repulsion decays. So D is a distance and lambda is a characteristic decay length. And this is a long set. So I, I didn't get to your question. So this is not a special thing for lipid barrier or anything, you know, for instance, you know, when you say measure the hydration of polymers in controlled humidity, what you see is nothing but the hydration repulsion. You know? So it exists between any hydrophob um, hydrophobic surfaces. Uh, hydrophilic. Hydrophilic surface. Yeah. Because we are looking at water. Or hydrophilic parts. Huh? And so it is not necessary to be surface. It can also be like hydrophobic only some parts. Yeah, but it is okay. decaying over distance from the surface, you see? Okay. It's not the bulk osmotic pressure. Okay. So of course, now in bulk, you know, we can describe the chemical potential of water simply by osmotic pressure. Mm. Well, when you go back to high school, not high school, but the first class physical chemistry, you know, you find Van Hoff's law, you no? Know? The osmotic pressure is given by 
huh, KT divided by molar volume of water times natural log of relative humidity. Well done, Motomi. Yes. That's how I remember from the textbook. Yeah. So there, you know, you can tune the osmotic pressure, namely the chemical potential water in the system by changing the humidity. What I'm talking here is how the repulsive force you know, decays in the presence of water. Yeah, I hope you get it, yes. And uh, so, so what you find here is that in combination of all these forces, that's why you can get the blood cell rupture in the surface. No, here I'm talking how the distance between cell membranes are kept constant. Because now, you know, when the force is balanced, there is no motion. Newton's first law. Yeah? Yeah? So in order to have a stable equilibrium distance, you need to achieve a balance of different forces. If this is destroyed, then you have continuous thinning, which results in the collapse, or your membrane is just separated more and more, and they are gone. And that's what I showed by computation here. As I said, so, you know, on thick cellulose, you see the scaling of Y. So this is the pressure is very shallow. You know? So the dip here is compared, you no, know, negligibly small compared to this one. Yeah. But still, you know, one can see how this osmotic repulsion is pushing away this, the system from the deep well of van der Waals attraction. You know, this is what I showed. Yes. So what is the magic that um, rupture, uh, that uh, make this break the cell and onto the surface? Yeah. So in order to wet, you know, you need to achieve the gain of the free energy. So, this is described by surface tension. And second is this no, no, no force balance uh, where it is. So what uh, is- At the very beginning, I explained. Yeah. Balance. Oh, wait a moment, wait a moment. I think you probably are not so much familiar with physics. So yeah, I mean, okay. So this is the first point. This is from the viewpoint of surface free energy. But if just look at this, you, know, you can imagine that every hydrophilic surface should do the job. But here, you know, okay, so if you have quartz or glass substrates, the interaction is just purely repulsive. So cells do not adhere on the surface, okay? So they are just repelled. When you have some polymers, you, know, you have the good balance of attraction and repulsion. They sit on the surface, and since they are hydrophilic, they wet. Yeah, so this is very similar. Well, not similar. So the first part is very similar if you consider the spreading of lipids on hydrophilic substrate and hydrophobic substrate. No? If you have hydrophilic substrate, you have the spreading of bilayer. But if you have a hydrophobic surface, you know, you have the spreading of lipid monolayer because the chain tail, hydrophobic tails that loves to spread on the surface by this you know, balance of the spreading coefficient. 